Richard Dawkins, Peter Singer, Michael Martin, these are some of the usual faces on the forefront of the atheist movement. And it's no secret that the community is one that has long been dominated by white men. But where are all the women? Are they not interested or are they just not welcomed? Joining us in our Google Hangout to discuss is Dr. Siki Vu Hutchinson, author of Godless Americana, Race and Religious Rebels in Los Angeles, California. Rebecca Watson, the founder of Skeptic.org in Buffalo, New York. And Ophelia Benson, the co-author of Does God Hate Women in Seattle, Washington. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, so why don't we just start with, you know, some basic numbers. Uh, there was a, a world religion survey that had looked at atheism within the United States and found that 3.6% of American men identified absolutely as atheist, uh, compared to 1.2% of American women who identified the same way. So, uh, you know, Dr. Hutchinson, maybe we can just start with you. When we look at those figures, A, what does it mean to be absolutely atheist? You know, you always have to look at the wording in any kind of a survey. And why do you think that there are Fewer women. Are women more reluctant to come out, um, you know, as, as being an absolute atheist? Or what do you think is at the root of it? I've actually never heard that appellation, um, af absolute atheist. I think it's interesting. Um, I would say that it's probably referring to a certain brand of militant, in your face, fist in the air, new atheism, which a lot of women do not subscribe to for reasons that go back to the dominance of organized religion in terms of really institutionalizing a certain very mainstream, very hierarchical notion of femininity. And if we look at what's at stake for women of color non-believers, for example, which I write extensively about in both Godless Americana and Moral Combat, women of color non-believers are going to be less out in the open because there's so much at stake and so much at risk in terms of the local communities that they exist in that are very much steeped within faith traditions. For example, Latinas are really driving the emergence of the Pentecostal movement within the United States. Um, large majorities of Latinas are steeped in Catholic traditions or Pentecostal traditions. And these are speaking to them because Pentecostal in particular because you have storefront churches, local community-based churches that are providing wraparound social services that they cannot get in other institutions and organizations in the community. African-American women are in a similar context and dynamic. Um, historically, the church has been a place to organize for African-American women, not just in terms of civil rights and social justice, but also in terms of being affirmed and reinforced in their cultural identity, um, allowing them to have some type of subjectivity with regard to their relationships, affirming their identities as caregivers. In addition to, of course, coming from an atheist perspective and, and critiquing the way in which the church is steeped in the dominant culture, in addition to being very problematic, very heterosexist, uh, you know, very patriarchal, very much informed by the cult of the charismatic male. The church has had a very paradoxical role in the trajectory of articulating black women's subjectivity. So circling back to the original question, black women non-believers and other women non-believers of color are not identifying by and large with some of the very marquee rock star white male atheist figures that have skyrocketed to fame by dint of several best-selling books that are not really speaking to the lived experiences, the cultural capital, the social history, and the crisis state that communities of color are in. And so, you know, that brings us back to this original question as to, um, you know, is there a, a question that a lot of people have asked is whether or not there is a woman problem within atheism as we see it today, the way that it's known, the way that, uh, you know, we see it represented within the media. And, you know, Ophelia, what would you say? Do you think that, you know, is there, um, is, does there tend to be a certain attitude amongst atheists that is, that is pushing women away? Or is it only because those figures that are held up, some of these best-selling authors, authors are, um, are, are they upheld by the media more? You know, why does it seem to be, at least from the outside perspective, dominated by white men? Well, a lot of the time, that's that's more um, what it looks like than the reality. It's it's a question of of habit and of what's been going on for the past five years or so. And it's a matter of, as you say, there are these um, gigantic bestsellers. So when people when people sort of 
try to draw to mind what atheists in general are, they're going to they're going to reach for the more obvious people, and those are the big best selling charismatic men, um, and so they keep doing that year after year after year, and that becomes what's available. And the longer people do that, the longer it seems that atheism is best-selling males. And it just looks like the same thing year after year after year. So what happens is that people just forget to go out looking for women. And then they start writing articles about asking the question, where are all the women? And the women respond. Um, I've responded. Rebecca's responded. Sakiva's responded. We're right here. Um, it's not that we're not here. It's that you, you haven't found us yet or you're just not looking in the right places. Um, and then a week later, there's another article by someone else saying, where are all the woman, women? So it is, it is to a considerable extent more of a perceptual problem than a problem of, of the actual absence of women. The Center for Inquiry in Washington, D.C. has put on two conferences about women in secularism. Um, and all three of us have attended at least one of those. Um, and the program is spectacular. They have brilliant woman after brilliant woman after brilliant woman um, giving wonderful talks and doing wonderful discussions. And that's only a small fraction of the people that, that had been considered to be invited. Um, there's obviously an enormous um, pool of, of brilliant atheist women who are out there, out there, out there and writing and talking. Um, and yet they still get, they still get overlooked. And so, you know, I mean, Rebecca, can part of the problem be that that these women aren't, you know, the, um, that you're not being proactive enough or loud enough? Uh, you know, I mean, p part of it has to deal with sure that uh, if if there are conferences and things like this, that they're going to keep reaching out, they're going to keep reaching out to the same people because they become the the recognizable names and they could draw a crowd, and that's what you know that'll that'll bring people to it. As I said, draw a crowd, but um, but there has to be some of your own initiative built into this too. Yeah, that's that's definitely the first time anyone has ever asked me if I'm not being loud enough. <laughs> um, normally, I'm I'm told that I'm being way too loud, uh, and that's part of the problem. Is that women in this community are often punished for speaking up and for um, putting themselves out there for hitting the stage, particularly if they hold opinions that a small group of anti-feminist misogynists uh, would prefer to not hear. So pretty much any woman in atheism who has tried to talk at all about the intersection between secularism and feminism, of which there is a huge and important intersection, uh, time after time we see these women attacked, viciously attacked online uh, by hordes of angry um, men's rights advocates. As well, they call well them actually, themselves. Rebecca, you have you have some personal uh, you know, experience with that, too, which, uh, you know, you you got into it with Richard Dawkins. And this is something that people have called elevator gate. But, you know, for those of our uh, viewers that might not be familiar with it, can you tell us that story? Uh, well, I'll try to make it as brief as possible because it's horribly boring by this point. <laughs> but uh, basically, I was at a conference in which uh, Richard Dawkins was in attendance on a panel with me. And I spoke a lot on stage and afterwards about how as a woman in this community, as a speaker, I'm often uh, the subject of a, quite a bit of sexual harassment, um, whether it be uh, quote unquote compliments or um, gendered slurs or people touching me without my permission. And uh, I brought it up as a way to, so we could start talking as a community, how do we uh, stop these behaviors in order to make women more welcome in this community? And uh, that night, very late that night, I uh, was at the bar with a bunch of people. I told everybody I was exhausted and going to bed, got on an elevator, a guy, uh, broke off from the crowd, came over, got on the elevator with me. I'd never spoken to him personally before. I had no idea who this was. And he said, uh, you know, basically, do you want to come back to my hotel room for a cup of coffee? And it was about four in the morning. Uh, and I said, no, thank you. And I got off the elevator and, and went to bed. Um, and when I got home, I made a YouTube video. I was putting out a lot of YouTube videos at the time, talked about my trip, 
mention this anecdote as a sort of humorous illustration of how some guys just aren't getting it. You know, I was speaking about this topic all day long and a guy still invites me back to his hotel room at four in the morning, you know, just after I get done 12 hours of talking about, please, you know, stop hitting on women, stop making them feel uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I thought it was a really obvious sort of anecdote to tell. Um, I was wrong. I was flooded with rape threats. Um, thanks, Internet. And uh, basically, the, the harassment I received went through the roof. Uh, what it was before was multiplied by a thousand. And then Richard Dawkins weighed in uh, by um, basically uh, poo pooing my uh, concerns by comparing them to the concerns of a, a mythical Muslim woman who is stoned and isn't allowed to drive and gets, uh, you know, uh, circumcised. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was incredibly insulting, not just to me, but to all of the women in this community who just want to be seen as regular human beings, who don't want to have to deal with nonstop sexual harassment just to go to a conference or to a talk or to exist online. And it was also insulting to Muslim women and women from, you know, Muslim-dominated cultures who... Are, are basically being used by people like Richard Dawkins. Uh, he pretends to be interested in their personal human rights, but it seems like all he's actually interested in is using them as a tool to, for his own gains, in this case, putting a Western feminist in her place. So after, after Dawkins weighed in, of course, the harassment took another upward spike, and Dawkins' fanboys to this day continue to chase after me. They make new Twitter accounts every time I block them. They harass me by email on Facebook. They post photos, photoshopped images of me, naked pornographic images uh, that they draw and post online. It's, it's not something that the average woman would ever want to deal with. Uh, it's something that I can only deal with because that's my superpower, is my ability to deal with hordes of trolls. But the average person is going to look at that and say, well, as a woman who wanted to speak out, who wanted to be up on stage talking about these issues, why should I bother now? Why should I put up with that? And I can't really say that I blame them. But when I talk to these women, I try to encourage them to do it anyway, because the more women we have who step forward and speak out, the more targets they have and the less effective they'll be at silencing each target. I mean, that sounds like a, a really a horrible experience that you've been through. And so, you know, what do you think that some of that stems from? Is it, um, you know, is someone like Richard Dawkins, like you said, is he being hypocritical? Is he being self-interested in this sense? Um, you know, is there just a, a certain a lack of community, uh, you know, within the atheist within the atheist community, I'm going to call it a community, but the thing is, you know, this is what we'll get into, what new atheism is, atheism is it too, and actually having more of an organizational structure to it rather than just a, a bunch of people that, that have a certain belief. Um, you know, I'm, I would love to hear from all of you on that. Dr. Hutchinson, you know, may, maybe you can start. I mean, is there something inherently um, misogynistic within this, or, or should we interpret it a different way? Well, I think that um, what Rebecca has evoked speaks to a lot of issues. Um, it speaks to slut shaming. It speaks to the, the the extent to which women have to be more moral. It speaks to the extent to which men, you know, are constantly encroaching upon women's space and women's subjectivity in order to speak truth to power. And this whole issue of the institutionalization of sexual harassment within the atheist context is really disclosing that atheist organizing is no different from other power structures that deeply inform the ways in which women are subjugated within secular context and within the context of organized religion. There's absolutely no difference in terms of men having investment in patriarchy, male privilege, and systems that attempt to silence control and police women. So all of us have really been frontal in trying to push back on, critique, deconstruct these kinds of dehumanizing and policing behaviors that emerge, not just within the web context, but within real time, um, and also make comparisons between 
the kind of censure that we get within the atheist context and the kind of stigmatization that we get within other dominant cultural contexts, be it public policy, be it education, particularly higher education, uh, be it organized religion, all of these systems of patriarchy, masculinist entitlement, and policing of women's behavior um, speak directly to why a lot of us subscribe to radical humanism from a feminist perspective. Let me read a comment I I here from, from one of our viewers really quick, uh, because I, I think that this one might, um, I think this one might anger some of our, uh, some of our panelists and I, and I wouldn't blame them, but it's interesting, you know, just, just going off of what you're saying, Dr. Hutchinson, in terms of, you know, in any type of, um, social construct or, you know, you're talking about the ed education too. We often then see women's movements pop up within them. And so uh, Adi Gondo Hartanu, one of our commenters, says, I find it strange that female atheists find it necessary to have to carve a spot in existing organizations. Why don't they create their own organization? They're free-minded. Why don't they create their own group, like the Black Atheist Association, and be an affiliate? Um, you know, so, I mean, uh, uh, Ophelia, would you think that, you know, does there need to be a separate woman's atheist, uh, you know, group carved out, or is that just going against everything that this is supposed to be, uh, you know, about here, which, <laughs> um, you know, which is that it should be all inclusive and it's pushing for rationalism and, uh, you know, against some of some of the dogma and, um, you know, th th that's been out there and that we've been culturally forced to, I guess, get, get used to or accept in a certain sense. Yeah, I very much think that's an absolutely terrible idea. One of the things um, we've been we've been getting told for the past few years is that is that it's their atheism and sometimes it's well we'll we want you to join us and or we'll let you join us and sometimes it's we don't want you to join us and we won't let you join us but either way it's framed as atheism is ours meaning men's when men are talking um, and it's not it's not yours it's not women's and. I think that's absolute nonsense. Women, atheism doesn't belong to men or women. Atheism belongs to everybody who wants to join as an atheist. And I have never for one moment thought that atheism as such or rebellion as such, just the, the larger idea of trying to make society better and trying to correct um, harmful ideas, that any of that kind of thing is the proper property of any one particular group even you know even if it's a great big group like the group of all men because there's an equally great big group on the other side that is all women so it just doesn't make sense um, to frame atheism as more of a guy that thing. said there are groups for that are focused on women like secular woman is one that just organized in the last year I think and also my website skeptic that formed as a way to give women a voice in a male dominated community and it's worked really well uh, in that we have a space where we can discuss issues that are important to us and at the same time we're able to uh, get more women blogging in an atmosphere where they have some backup if they should be attacked online uh, and also it gets their name out there so a lot of the writers for Skeptic have gone on to start doing talks they start out going to panels that we host maybe and then they move on to doing their own talks or they're starting their other other organizations so you know there are there are these specialized groups within the atheist umbrella but yeah, at the same time, as Ophelia says, you know, it's so important that we actually get into uh, the larger atheist sphere. The, the large organizations need to recognize that women are an important and valuable resource. And, and about creating, you know, an, an environment where women can feel comfortable in it, too. And so in that sense, how important is leadership, right? I mean, how important would it be for if, if you look at just politically what's been going on, uh, you know, there in politics, and I think that it still is this way, uh, you know, but there there are women's issues that historically used to be called women's issues. Now politicians are trying to no longer call them that, right? I mean, it's about equal rights. These are supposed to be issues that, that any any uh, anybody can and will and should push for and support when it comes to childcare, when it comes to the importance of education and things like this. And so, you know, amongst atheist leaders, uh, you know, how influential would it be for someone like Richard Dawkins to 
to play a more prominent role in trying to be more, uh, you know, more inclusive in something like this, to, to talk about the importance of women atheists. How important is it for some of these panels and some of these, um, you know, meetings and conferences that you have for them to hold up women and say, we're not going to have any panels if there aren't women also that are equally represented on them? Mm -hmm. So what I would say on that, um, circling back to the earlier point, is that atheists of color and feminist atheists have really been on the front lines of changing the agenda and reshaping the platform of organized atheism and organized atheist activism, insofar as we are saying that if we're coming from communities of color that are steeped in regimes of mass incarceration and school to prison pipelining, the linchpin of our humanism and the linchpin of our secular activism is going to be on social justice, on gender justice, on ensuring that there is a broader spectrum of issues that are addressed within mainstream atheist venues. For example, Black Septus Los Angeles, which is predominantly women of color, spearheaded a first in the family humanist scholarship. And it was specifically targeting undocumented LGBTQ, homeless and foster care youth because those youth face the greatest challenges in going to college and getting prepared for college and staying in college and in graduating from college. This is not an issue that has been addressed by the mainstream atheist movement. And it is an intersectional issue that again, feminist non-believers of color have put on the agenda, have made a platform for a national activism. And there are a number of under the radar atheist of color organizations that are focusing on this nexus of gender justice, racial justice, and social justice, as well as economic justice. So there is, for example, a group called Black Nonbelievers of Chicago, which sponsors an incredible podcast by the Black Freethinkers and looks at these issues of anti-racism, anti-sexism, um, addressing economic injustice and disenfranchisement in communities of color. Uh, there are groups called the Black Atheists of America and Black Nonbelievers of Atlanta. They just put on a blackout secular rally, um, again, spearheaded by African-American women that focuses on these deep and abiding and intractable institutional inequities that inform the lived experiences and the cultural capital of people of color. So there has been a paradigm shift within mainstream atheism that is bubbling beneath the surface that most of these European American rock star, best selling academic scientist, male atheist are never ever going to consider or to privilege because that is not the crux of their experience. Yeah. Well, I just mean it, it could even be something like, uh, you know, if you're constantly arguing for religion to to get out of government, uh, you know, for all of us not to be moralized, then maybe you need some of these, uh, you know, other leaders to speak out about you know, laws that we see being passed within the states that are uh, incredibly repressive towards women's reproductive rights and towards abortion. And, you know, that could be something that is perhaps uh, easier for mass audiences to consume as a way to just start broaching the topic and, and getting into it. So we have to wrap it up here in a moment. But, um, you know, just just finally, could someone, uh, you know, Ophelia, maybe I'll go to you first. Could you explain to us what the difference between just atheism and new atheism is? New atheism is just is basically just a, a media catchword um, for a more outspoken, argumentative, um, out front, sometimes belligerent, um, willing to be critical brand of atheism, and it's and it's also it's explicit atheism as opposed to passive atheism, which means just. Um, being an atheist but not talking about it and not making a point of it and not introducing yourself as an atheist. And so, you know, Rebecca, I'll leave it here with you. Um, you know, do you think that women um, would be, would women be more attracted to just atheism rather than this more aggressive brand of it? Uh, you know, do you think that that has something to do with it? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know that, it, I mean, of course, women in our culture are raised to be, you know, kind and caring and not to speak out and not to be contrarian the way that we expect the new atheists to be. But if we look through the history of free thinkers, women are everywhere, everywhere. And they're 
just as angry and outspoken as Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris are today. So no, I think that the main thing is something that Sakivu touched on. We need atheists to start focusing more on women's issues, um, you know, the Republican war on women, kicking the religious right out of our government. When we start focusing on things like that, you're going to see more women getting involved and identifying openly as atheists. All right. Well, wonderful points made by all tonight. I want to thank you for joining me, Dr. Hutchinson, Rebecca, and Ophelia. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, that's it for Hep Us Live this evening, but make sure to come back tomorrow for all new content. And in the meantime, there's always something to watch because the conversation always continues here on Hep Us Live. <laughs>